Let's talk about the next generation of interstellar transit engines that NASA is currently hard at work on. No, it's not a warp drive or a hyperdrive and definitely not a Holtzman engine, but this is actually in the same kind of ballpark as an Epstein drive from the Expanse, a nuclear-powered engine. We recently learned two very exciting things from NASA's Artemis program roadmap that outlines their plan to expand crewed missions from the moon to Mars and beyond. For one, NASA is planning to build a giant interplanetary spaceship called a transit hab. And two, they are going to demonstrate a nuclear propulsion system as part of their operations on and around the moon. These two inventions would naturally be a perfect pairing because nuclear propulsion will increase both the speed and efficiency of interplanetary transit, which will become very important once we start sending human beings on these extended voyages. Now, there are a few ways that we can harness nuclear power to drive a spaceship, some of which have already been researched and tested, others are still a bit hypothetical, and we don't know which direction NASA is planning to take for powering their interplanetary transport, but we can definitely have some fun speculating on how this might play out and investigate some of the options that might still be available. So, let's get into it. This is the space race. We can start off with some known knowns here. According to NASA's most recent Artemis update, they are now fully dedicated to establishing a sustained presence on the surface of the moon and in cislunar space over the next decade. And then, they will use the moon as a testing ground to demonstrate and perfect the technology that will allow NASA to use the moon as a foothold to Mars, and eventually send their first crewed mission to the red planet. NASA has outlined two existing plans for sending humans to Mars. Their first mission would be a short duration, obviously, and then there is also an idea for a long duration mission to Mars. For the short stay mission, the outbound period will last 217 days and utilize a gravitational assist around the planet Venus to boost the spacecraft on its way. The stay on Mars will last for 30 days, and the return trip will be a grueling 403 days in deep space. All that adds up to a mission duration of 650 days. For the long stay mission, the outbound period will be 210 days on a direct course from Earth to Mars, no gravitational boost required. The stay on Mars in this scenario will be 496 days, and then the return window is shortened to 210 days because the crew will be taking advantage of an ideal transfer window. That adds up to a staggering 916 days away from Earth and all of the protection that it offers. As it stands, there are two major foreseeable problems with these mission outlines. Firstly, we have no idea if the human mind can stand up to such an extended period of isolation and confinement while hurtling through deep space. Can a crew of four people hold it together for two years and secondly, and most concerningly, we have no idea what effect this prolonged exposure to deep space will have on their bodies. There is a lot of radiation in space. We're protected from it here on Earth by the planet's magnetic field, and that also protects the people on board the International Space Station as well. But anything outside of that magnetosphere is fully exposed. Most of the radiation in space is coming from galactic cosmic rays. These are charged particles that are blasted through space at tremendous speed by the supernova explosions of dying stars. It sounds cool, but you don't want that in your life. And the longer time that people spend outside of Earth's protective barrier, the greater that exposure will be. And then thrown on top of that is the known degradation to the human body that will happen in a zero gravity environment. One thing that we can say for sure is that there will be no artificial gravity happening on the Mars transit hub. So that means even with the crew sticking to a rigorous exercise plan, 
they will lose muscle and bone density. Microgravity is also known to reduce the function of the immune system and the vital organs. So that combined with cosmic radiation is going to put these travelers at an unprecedented level of risk to their health. The obvious way to fix all of these problems would be to just get them there and back faster. Going back to that timeline for the first crewed mission, it's really that 403 day return trip that stands out as being the most problematic aspect. So our thinking is that NASA has created these timelines based on the technology that they currently have available because that's the best they can do at the moment. But we do not believe that our current rocket technology is going to be what powers the Mars transit hab. And we don't think that NASA does either. If we go back to the Artemis blueprint and look at the mission outline for Artemis 8, if NASA can hold to their timeline of completing one Artemis moon mission per year, starting with their first human landing on Artemis 3, which is aspirationally scheduled for 2025, then Artemis 8 should be happening around the year 2030. Artemis 8 will be the first 30-day mission for two crew members on the moon's surface. It will also include a demonstration of NASA's upcoming nuclear propulsion system. So, this is our strongest indication that NASA is working on a nuclear propulsion engine and that they expect to have a functioning prototype by 2030. While we're looking at it, we can also note Artemis 12. This is going to be a big one. This is when the Mars 1 human lander with surface subsystems and the transit hab Mars ship will be delivered to the gateway station in orbit around the moon. So again, according to the timeline, this will be a finished interplanetary ship ready to fly to Mars, and that should come four years after the first demonstration of the nuclear propulsion system. So I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that the nuclear engine demonstrated on Artemis 8 will be the engine fitted to the transit hab when it arrives at the moon on Artemis 12. So now that we have all that established, let's talk about how nuclear propulsion can solve the problems that we've outlined and why NASA is pursuing this technology. As of right now, our spaceships are powered by liquid chemical rocket engines. Liquid rocket engines are fairly simple in their basic design. You have two tanks, one containing rocket fuel and one containing oxygen. Those two elements are pumped into a combustion chamber and then exploded. The explosion produces exhaust gas that is pushed through a nozzle to accelerate its flow and produce thrust. And we all know that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So the action of blasting all of that high pressure exhaust gas out of the back of the rocket will push the ship forward or upward, whichever direction it happened to be pointing. Chemical engines are very powerful, but they are also very inefficient. It takes a spectacular amount of fuel and oxidizer to burn a chemical engine for even a very short amount of time. Just look at the SpaceX Starship and its need for an orbital refilling session to go beyond low Earth orbit. Nuclear thermal engines provide that boost in efficiency that chemical engines are lacking. A nuclear thermal rocket operates using heat generated by a nuclear reaction. In this case, we are talking about nuclear fission, which is also referred to as splitting the atom. And those atoms are from the element uranium. The nuclear energy of fission would replace the chemical energy of exploding propellants in the rocket engine design. We still need a working fluid of low molecular weight that will create the exhaust gas that will flow through the nozzle and create thrust. In this case, that will be liquid hydrogen. The hydrogen is fed into the nuclear reactor where the extreme heat causes that liquid to readily expand into a gas, which is then pushed through the nozzle and creates thrust. This process, using hydrogen, allows for the nuclear thermal engine to reach twice the efficiency of a chemical engine, meaning it can sustain the same amount of energy for double the amount of time. Now we're already talking about cutting that Mars transit time in half and therefore having the stress of the crew's minds and bodies, and also having their exposure to cosmic radiation. This is a very good thing. Though it does come with a downside, and that is the hydrogen fuel. 
For this process to work, the hydrogen must remain in a liquid state, and that means holding it at a super chilled cryogenic temperature. That takes some engineering, but it should be possible. The other problem with hydrogen is that the atoms can actually move through solid material, so the hydrogen can very slowly escape the storage tank just by moving through the walls. This is only a problem for long duration storage, but if we're looking at a thousand days or more for a long duration Mars mission, it could be problematic. But interestingly, hydrogen is the only element that would work effectively in a nuclear thermal engine as we know it. Hydrogen has the lowest molecular weight of all known elements, and the lower the mass of your engine's exhaust gas is, the higher the velocity of that exhaust will be. And remember, the equal and opposite reaction. The faster the gas comes blasting out of the back, the faster the ship will be propelled forward. The next lightest element we have would be helium, but it's still twice the weight of hydrogen, and therefore would only produce half the amount of thrust, and that would actually negate any advantage of a nuclear engine because it would be back down to the same efficiency as chemical combustion. This is the kind of nuclear propulsion engine that we would expect NASA to be working on because we know it is a design that they have already built and even tested in the past. We know that it works. Back in the 1960s, there was a NASA program called Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Application, or NERVA. Under the direction of Nazi rocket scientist Werner von Braun, the agency actually constructed a low-thrust, thermodynamic nuclear rocket engine and tested it at a secret facility in Jackass Flats, Nevada. Von Braun's dream was to use nuclear power to expand the Apollo program to Mars in the 1970s and 80s. The project was fairly short-lived, and President Nixon killed their funding by 1973, and the money ended up going into the Space Shuttle program, which was probably for the best because firing a nuclear rocket engine anywhere near the Earth's atmosphere, let alone inside the atmosphere, is not very smart obviously, and this would be a great reason why NASA intends to test their new generation of nuclear thermal propulsion out in cislunar space, which is well beyond the reach of Earth's magnetic field. The moon is already bombarded by those cosmic rays that we talked about earlier, the moon is radioactive as hell, and you can't really make it any worse. In the summer of 2021, NASA was finally granted $110 million in funding to advance development of a new nuclear rocket suitable for sending cargo and crew on interplanetary voyages. Finally, NASA would resume work that had been left on the shelf for nearly 50 years. NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy have teamed up to fund three design concepts for reactors that could become part of a nuclear thermal propulsion system. Each contract is worth around $5 million and will fund 12 months of development work. That means that as of June 2022, we are only a couple of months away from seeing the results of this work. And we haven't even gotten to the more speculative varieties of nuclear propulsion technology that are sustained fusion drives, saltwater nuclear engines, nuclear pulse propulsion. For some reason, I thought these would all fit into this video, but this is already getting long in the tooth, so that might be a topic for another video. Please let us know in the comments section if you would be interested in an overview of some more speculative nuclear propulsion technologies. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.